There's a parable from the 1930s uh, that tells the story of a woman sitting by a river enjoying a nice, relaxing afternoon when all of a sudden she looks up and sees that there's a child drowning in the river. So she stops everything she's doing and jumps into the river, drags this child safely to shore where she saves his life. And as soon as she saves his life, she looks up and notices that there's another child struggling and trying to swim but actively drowning in the river. So she leaves the child that she saves and jumps into the river to save yet another child, brings this child safely to shore, and then notices that this happens again and again, person after person, child after child. She notices is drowning in this river right in front of her. So she jumps in and starts to gather those people who are around her. Please, would you help me? Would you, would you help? And there's all kinds of children by this point who are trying to swim, but they can't. And so they decide in this moment, let's save as many as we can, but let's try to teach as many as we can how to swim. And so she begins to teach with the other people that she's recruited. She begins to teach these children how to swim, but the reality is it's just, it's exhausting. It's overwhelming. All of the kids aren't learning how to swim. Not everybody can do it. And so one person who's saving the kids with this lady starts to crawl out of the river and begin to walk upstream. And as she walks upstream, she finds a bridge that crosses over from one side of the river to the other, and it leads to a playground where all of these children are trying to get to. But what the children don't see is that on this bridge, in this bridge, is a, is a massive hole that they don't even recognize, they don't even realize until they've already fallen through it. And she knows that if we, if we put some work and if we put some effort into repairing the bridge, then we can prevent a whole lot of drowning and a whole lot of death in the meantime. As we've been on this journey through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been leveraging this upstream principle all throughout the sermon to drill down to the heart of the matter, to get below the surface, to not just stay on the surface and kind of touch on some religious topics and some religious ideas, but to drill down to the heart of the matter, to the motivations that we have, the things that drive us and compel us and also at the same time can drown us. Jesus has been doing this through a series of six antithesis. This, is, this word antithesis is uh, two words kind of put together. It's anti, which means against, and thesis, which means idea. And this word antithesis, as Jesus is using it, uh, means that it's any idea that goes against what we've always known, how we've always done things, how culture usually acts and reacts. And so up to this point, Jesus has taken us through three of the six antitheses when he says, you have heard it said, don't murder. But I tell you, Jesus tells us, in my kingdom, people get upstream from murder by addressing the anger in our hearts, by becoming friends over being enemies. Jesus then goes on to say, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, in my kingdom, my followers get upstream from adultery by being careful with their eyes and dealing drastically with lust. Jesus goes on, you've heard it said that, uh, that men must do the right thing when leaving their marriage. They ought to give their vulnerable ex-wife a divorce certificate so that she can defend herself against the charge of adultery. But I tell you, in my kingdom, my followers get upstream from divorce by fighting for each other instead of fighting against each other. Of course, there are still those reasons that Jesus in Scripture provides of abuse and abandonment and, and adultery. But Jesus has walked us through six, three of the six antitheses, and we get to the fourth in Matthew chapter 5, Verse 33, and this is what Jesus says. You, again, for the fourth time, as if we haven't heard enough, again, Jesus says, you have heard it said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord 
what you've sworn. But I say to you, don't take an oath at all. Whew, finally, we get something to talk about today that doesn't seem like it's pointed and poignantly directed right at us. It feels like a moment that we can kind of relax a bit, doesn't it? feels like a moment that we can kind of kick up our feet because if you think about it, outside of your wedding day and outside of jury duty, you probably haven't really sworn an oath at all, which leads us to believe we're probably batting a thousand here. Like this is, this is working out well for us, Jesus. Finally, you've given us one that we can succeed with, but what we're gonna see is this one hits all of us square in the shins as Jesus begins to pivot from sexual and family ethic to now talk about thoughts and human communication, particularly about this issue of honesty as Jesus now provides this brand new next level integrity. And so his invitation here is to this whole idea of honesty and and integrity. This is how Jesus summarizes it in verse 37. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Honesty and truth-telling is at the forefront of our national conversation, is it not? A recent research study shows that two-thirds of teenagers in the United States admit that they have lied to a parent, lied to a teacher or authority figure, or someone in their life in the last 90 days. Uh, Research can't back this up, but some people would say the other third of those teenagers are lying about lying, and yet here we are. 60%, this same study showed, 60% of teenagers admitted that they lied to a friend or a peer. 30% admitted that they cheated on a test in the last three months. Is this some small issue, or is it a symptom of a broader problem in our society? From the very beginning of time, honesty was the assumption for human interactions. Without that assumption, trust breaks down culture into chaos. And the problem with disingenuous language, dishonesty, lying, is that eventually we learn to hide behind our words. It's kind of become the default way that we handle all of our interactions, which eventually downstream leads to decades of misdirection to the point that we can get really efficient and really effective and end up living a life where we're not even really honest about anything ever. Harvard did a research study on lying, and they said that there are three main ways that humans lie. There's the lying of commission. This is an active use of false statements. This is literally saying something that is absolutely not true. Lying by commission. Then there's the way of lying by omission. Failing to disclose relevant information. So not sharing something that would then prove that you're actually not sharing what's true. Then there's a third way. Maybe you've never heard of this. It's It's a way of lying that Harvard calls paltering. Paltering is the active use of truthful statements to convey a misleading impression. Todd Rogers of the Kennedy School broke it down this way as he was explaining all of these different ways of lying. We've got the lying by commission. We know what that is, clear as day. But he used the illustration of a used car salesman. Let's say you're going to buy a used car, and you go to the used car salesman, and And you say, you know, I I assume that this car is in excellent shape. And the used car salesman would then reply, well, the engine runs. Not to mention that the transmission needs replacing. Not to mention that the clutch hasn't hasn't been working correctly. And I'm uh, attempting in this moment to come up with mechanical language to somehow prove to you that I know about auto and mechanics, but I don't have a clue what I'm talking about. This This would be the sin and the lie of omission. But then let's say you go to the used car salesman and say, I I assume the car is running great. And the the used car salesman said, yeah, I took it out for a drive yesterday and and it it runs great. Not to mention that the day before he couldn't get the thing to start. Not to mention that uh, two weeks before they found out that the tires are completely bald. That would be the lying of paltering. 
And what we're going to see is that Jesus shows us that misleading others with our words is so problematic to human flourishing. This is how Jesus starts by talking about honesty. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, again, you've heard it said to those of old. So Jesus is hearkening back to Old Testament law. And he says, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. Now, Jesus isn't quoting just one specific law. Instead, he's borrowing language, language from a handful of Old Testament passages about this ancient practice called swearing oaths, which, again, many of us would say, well, what's the big deal with that? Like, I haven't sworn any oaths recently. Here's the big deal. Imagine you're a first century fisherman. And imagine that as a first century fisherman, your business is booming. Things are going incredibly well in your fishing, uh, in your fishing business to the, to the point that it's growing exponentially faster and larger than everyone else in your region. To the point that you're scaling your business, thinking about franchising to other regions, building out all of your equipment with the best and the biggest technology, replacing all of your nets, getting brand new boats, which would then lead to people in your region becoming a little jealous, uh, a little frustrated even. So there's, there's some tension building. His business is building and mine is just floundering. Well, imagine one day as your successful uh, fishing enterprise is doing great, you notice that several nets are missing and some of the equipment from your boat is gone. And imagine that in that moment you just assume that it's one of the other jealous fishing companies who's taken the net. But you take that assumption and turn it into an accusation and say, you know what, I actually saw the, this other fishing family do it. And then use this, this ancient oath, swearing oath language like they would and said, I saw him stealing my fish nets, and I swear to you by Yahweh that I saw him do it. And so in order to bolster your claim, in order to bolster, bolster their claim in that day, they, that, to show that they were telling the truth, you would drag God's name into it. You would use God's name to strengthen your accusation by association because everybody knew, God followers and not, everybody knew that God was truthful and holy. And so using this ancient practice of swearing oaths would use God's name to make your claim even more serious. It happened all the time. Using God's name to strengthen a lie. It happened so much that the rabbis called this and gave this name, uh, this name of swearing oaths, this practice of taking God's name in vain. Scripture addresses this in Exodus chapter 20, as well as Leviticus chapter 19. You can go and do some homework a little bit later, but in our day, swearing has become synonymous for foul language. Sometimes, you use, sometimes people use God or Jesus as part of their swearing and foul language. But let's be clear, this is not what Jesus is talking about in the passage. In our own day, we have our own version of using God's name in vain. And I am not talking about saying, oh my God. Which I'm not also recommending or suggesting that you add that to your daily vernacular. But the way that we do it today is maybe you've had a conversation with a Christian and they're talking to you about a decision that they've made, and they say to you, you know what, I, I feel like God's calling me to do this. You know what, God told me that the Holy Spirit is leading me, and God wants me to tell you. Now, now two things as, as we hear these things. Number one, there, there's, there is a chance that this person is being 100% legit. They're seeking God, they're sensing God lead them in a direction, they're abiding in the vine, they're seeking God, they're discerning his will through prayer and through community, but there's also another thing that could be at play here. Secondly, they may not be 100% legit. I've also found that more often than not, this is just a strategy that Christians use to shut down discussion and further our own personal agendas. Instead of saying, you know what, I really want to do this, I'd really like 
to go there. I, I'd really like for this to be the direction of our life or our family or our, our community. They say, well, God told them. And how can we even respond to something like that? Now, I'm not saying to always question and doubt somebody, but if you, if you dig a little bit deeper in those conversations to ask someone how they heard from God, you may well hear that they prayed about it once, and then they went to their friend who never pushes back on any idea, and that friend thought it was a good idea. The reality is, when someone tells you that God's called them to something, the conversation's kind of over, isn't it? I know it's a tad touchy, but some of us have learned to skillfully use religious language to, to get our own personal way and to shut down dissenting views. And I am just here to tell you that that is taking God's name in vain. 20 years ago, the way that we did this was uh, we used it in, in dating. You probably remember this kind of trend in dating. You know what? God told me that we just need to take a break, so we need to break up. No, we didn't. You're dating someone else the next week. Today, in our language today, I'm telling you this. I've heard this. Not from Mountain View people, but from, from other people I've done ministry with. I've heard somebody literally tell me, Pastor, uh, this ex of mine from high school showed up as a friend's suggestion. Tell me that's not God's sovereignty. And I'm like, it's not. It's Mark Zuckerberg's algorithm. But yet, this is what we do. God told me. I, I, I just feel like the Lord is wanting something different. I, I was having breakfast the other day, and I heard the Spirit tell me when it's really in actuality just what you want and just what you desire. There's a version of taking God's name in vain when, when we just want something, and we use God's name to leverage his holiness and his goodness to advance our own personal agenda. As a pastor, I hear this all the time. Pastor, God, God told me that we should have this new ministry at our church. God, God gave me a vision and an idea that the church ought to take on. God called me to this. I sense the Lord telling us. Uh, I've even heard God told me to leave my wife and go and pursue someone else that would meet my desires. And, and I know it's from God because I have a peace about it literally heard this and I'm thinking could it be that you just saw a great movie last night like did you just have a great no I've got I've got peace in my heart can I remind us all what Jeremiah warns us all of in Jeremiah 17 verse 9 Jeremiah this prophet reminds God's people God's people not just pagan people the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Our heart is, is deceptive. So do you want to know how to know if something's from God? Uh, let me just give you a few things. You can know that something and a word is from God if, number one, it's found in God's word. If it's uh, the character of God, it's consistent with God's character. If it glorifies God and if it benefits others, if it's self-centered, that's not from God, that's from you. If it's self-absorbed and self-glorifying and you can't find it in Scripture, you can't square it with the character of God, it's not from God. Yes, the Holy Spirit still speaks today. But Holy Spirit never speaks contrary to God's word and never differs from the character of God. So ask yourself, will this, will this decision lead me to be more like Jesus? Or will this lead me away from Jesus? Uh, ask, God, what do you want for my life? And what do you want for my family? Because God's name gets associated with deception and it defiles it. When we use God's name to do things that he wants nothing to do with, it's an abuse of God's reputation and it's like Christian gaslighting where God's name is used to redefine reality in such a way that serves an ungodly agenda. There were laws in ancient Israel, so people couldn't use God's name in vain like this, but they found workarounds. Let me show you what I'm talking about. These are the workarounds they found to this ancient oath. So I won't, I won't use God's name in vain. Here's what I'll do. And Jesus warns, verse 34, But I say to you, don't take an oath at all. 
either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your own head, for you can't make one hair white or black. I can testify. I wouldn't have chosen this. Jesus is saying, you may not be taking God's name in vain, but you're, you're taking, okay, I swear by heaven, heaven, I swear by earth, I swear by Jerusalem, the holy city, I swear by my own head and my own life, and Jesus says here, just so that you're not using God's name in vain, these are all, these are all things associated with God. And Jesus is saying, essentially, listen, all of these stuff that you're swearing by, it all comes from God anyway, so quit with the loopholes. How often are we trying to loophole our Christianity and our relationship with Jesus? Dallas Willard summarizes it this way. Jesus goes right to the heart of why people swear oaths. He knew that they do it to impress others with their sincerity and reliability and thus gain acceptance of what they're saying and what they want. It's a method for getting their own way. They're declaring some promise or purpose or some point of information or knowledge dear to them, and they want their hearers to accept what they say and do what they want. So they say, by God, or they say, God knows, to lend weight to their words and their presence. It's simply a device of manipulation designed to override the judgment and will of the ones that they're focusing upon, to push them aside rather than respecting them and leaving their decision and action strictly up to them. Friends, the, the, the dark part of all of this, where this ancient practice intersects painfully with our own life, is when Christians adopt a lifestyle where we craftily use words to get what we want and push forward our ungodly agendas. Let's call it what it is. It's manipulation. When we have a preference or an opinion or an idea, do we own it and say, you know what, this is what I want, or do we spin it? If we spin it, rather than owning it, we're just being cowards. We're, we're just not admitting our own preference of, or, or doing the hard work of defending our preference. When we make a mistake at home, at work, in our marriage, with our kids, do we own it? Or do we spin it? Jesus says that the portrait of someone whose heart is being remade by Jesus, is being shaped by this Jesus way, is that we are honest with each other. It's just that simple. A disciple of Christ does not use spin. And now Jesus uses this life-giving alternative to all of the wordplay, all of the spin, and it's this life defined by simple and honest and truthful communication. This is how Jesus boils it down. Don't swear an oath at all. Jump to verse 37. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. This is Jesus laying this foundation of next level integrity. All you need to say is simply yes or no. All, all you need to say is yes and do it or no, and don't do it. Stop paltering. Stop spinning. Stop manipulating and misdirecting and stop using God's name to further your own personal agenda. There are a few things that I want us to wrestle with this week as, as we wrestle with the truth of this text in our own life because can I just remind us that Jesus didn't give this sermon just for this culture Jesus gave this for us and has a word for us today. So a few things I want us to wrestle with. And let me just tell you, I am in this with you. I'm preaching as much to a mirror as I am to a crowd. So we can be shaped by Jesus and so that we can live the Jesus way. Here's a few things. Number one, we got to deal ruthlessly with spin. we got to deal ruthlessly to get spin out of our life. I just want us to take a, an honest, searching, and fearless moral inventory this week. Like how often am I using words to trick people into getting my own way? I just want to get a real sense of what's going on in my heart, and I want that for you as well. Let's deal ruthlessly with spin. But number two, let's become a person 
capable of an honest yes and an honest no. This is intensely practical. But make no mistake, this is the Jesus way of living. Let's become a people and a person capable of an honest yes and an honest no. In a room this size, uh, with as many people as we have today, there's likely somebody that lives a lifestyle of overcommitment. Please don't amen. Maybe you know somebody who is greatly overcommitted in their life. Jesus invites us to a very simple lifestyle. He says, when it's appropriate to say yes, say yes. When it's appropriate to say no, just say no. Somebody needs to hear this today. Anne Lamott says it this way, no is a complete sentence. For the people pleasers in the room, are you with me? For the people pleasers in the room, this is a quote for you, but you can also, for the people pleasers, no thank you is a complete sentence. We gotta learn how to say no in our life, and if it's, if it's no, be honest about it. No spin, no like discerning and uh, putting some public relations spin on your text. Oh, I, I can't make it. I gotta be at the gym today. Bro, you don't even work out. <laughs> Let's stop spinning as followers of Jesus. What will I give my yes to, and what are the things that I'll say no to? And here's the beauty of it. Saying no to good things allows you to say yes to great things. Let's just, as, as followers of Jesus, let's quit this whole thing of, sure, I may be able to help out with that event. When you have zero plans to go, like somebody asks you to help them move, if you're not a moving type, just say no. Instead of saying, oh, yeah, let me check. Uh, maybe we're not doing anything that day. When you've got zero plans of going, and then they text you and you ghost them, and you're like, new phone, who dis? Let's stop playing games with our words and with our phrases and with our friends. Number three, do what you say you'll do. As followers of Jesus, this baseline foundational life that Jesus calls us to is that we will do what we say we'll do. So as you think through the implications of this message, I just want you to ask the Holy Spirit to get involved and show you areas where you're just not honest. Maybe, maybe it's as simple as your driver's license. Please don't make me go into detail on what I'm talking about. Maybe it's your driver's license where you're not honest, but yet that little thing has crept into this lifestyle of manipulation and disingenuous talk with people. Maybe for you it's, it's the lying of commission or the lying of omission. Maybe you can manipulate and spin so good in your life that you can sell ice to an Eskimo and talk a hungry dog off a, off a meat truck. Maybe for you, you're reflecting on the words of Jesus and maybe it's helpful for you to ask just a couple of questions. What are some areas in my life where I'm prone to exaggeration? Embellishment. Flat out Lying. Be brave today as you, as you explore that with Jesus. Don't listen to this message with somebody else in mind. We've all got friends who just lie to our face. Don't, don't be the friend who's thinking about that friend. Think about yourself. How do I use words to manipulate other people? Maybe, maybe for you today, you're just unaware and need to invite somebody to speak into this. Maybe because you're unaware of the manipulation and possibly even narcissistic tendencies in your own life. Ask yourself this, do I have a habit of using God's name to further my agenda. Friends, you'll never, you'll never address what you don't confess. You can make excuses today or you can make progress, but you can't make both. Of all of the lies that we tell, the lies that we tell ourselves are the most deadly. Let's get honest today. Let's do work with Jesus. Maybe, maybe you need to do work with others and repent to your family and your friends and your coworkers and your, your neighbors. Maybe there's some repentance that needs to happen in the room today. Repentance doesn't mean that we feel bad about the things that we've done and then just leave beating ourselves up. No, repentance means that we name the truth that's bad and stop doing that thing and start walking in a different direction today. Whatever God's doing in your own life, around this whole idea of maybe taking his name in vain, maybe not being honest in your communication with others. Would you start new today? 
Our God is a God of new. What new is he wanting to do in your life today? Let's pray together. Jesus, just when we thought if we had a week to prop our feet up and listen to an encouraging message, you come and bring this truth that wrecks our comfort. And as much as we don't like it, God, I ask today, I would beg that you would make us uncomfortable so that you can make us more like Jesus. God, would you shape every aspect of our heart, every aspect of our life and our relationship so that every word that we speak is honest and honoring to the people that we speak to. God, today we repent. We know we've messed up, but we thank you that you're a God who finds us when we've messed up and picks us up and leads us to a life shaped by you. We wanna be more like Jesus. And so we pray this in his name.